test, test. brothers and sisters. Someone left their lights on in their car. A white Ford Escape, brand new. You left your lights on in your car. White Ford Escape parked that away. Let us stand and celebrate the Holy Eucharist. Thank you. 
Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Grace and peace from God the Father who comes to us in Christ Jesus be always with you. And with your spirit. God transforms us by his coming. The Lord comes into our lives, we become different, we become healed, we become strengthened, we become renewed. We open our hearts to the healing and renewing grace of God working in Christ as we begin this Eucharist. We seek the Lord's grace, mercy, forgiveness, healing, and peace. Almighty God, have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. Lord our God, you will that our infirmities be borne by your only begotten Son to show the value of human suffering. Listen in kindness to our prayers for all of our brothers and sisters who are sick. Grant that all who are oppressed by pain, distress, and other afflictions may know that they are chosen among those proclaimed blessed and are united to Christ in his suffering for the salvation of the world. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. To whom can you liken me as an equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things. He leads out their army and numbers them, calling them by name. By his great might and the strength of his power, not one of them is missing. Why, O Jacob, do you say, and declare, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Do you not know, or have you not heard? The Lord is the eternal God creator of the ends of the earth. 
He does not faint nor grow weary, and his knowledge is beyond scrutiny. He gives strength to the fainting. For the weak, he makes vigor abound. Though young men faint and grow weary, and youths stagger and fall, they that hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar as with eagles' wings. They will run and not grow weary, walk and not grow faint. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The responsorial psalm. O bless the Lord, my soul. O bless the Lord, my soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all my being. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. O bless, bless the, the Lord, Lord, my soul. He pardons all your iniquities. He heals all your ills. He redeems your life from destruction. He crowns you with kindness and compassion. Oh, oh bless, bless the Lord, my soul. Merciful and gracious is the Lord, slow to anger and abounding in kindness. Not according to our sins does he deal with us nor does he requit us according to our crimes. O oh, bless, bless the Lord, Lord my soul. Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus said to the crowds, Come to me, all you who labor and are burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart. And you will find rest for yourselves. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. Yeah, I know. Some people are saying it's morning somewhere. Well, it's such a joy to be with you. And before we, we dive into the rest of, of the mission and, and particularly the, uh, the healing and the anointing, I just want to thank Father, all the fathers, for their gracious hospitality. Putting me up in the shed at the rectory has been really wonderful. <laughs> um, no, they've been so gracious, and, and it's been great hanging out and being a bachelor with these guys. It's... Uh, Really, it's so much fun. You young guys should try it. Um, but thank you. I really appreciate it very much for your, for, and thank you to you. Uh, as I was sharing today in the, we had a staff day, a staff retreat, and, and I was sharing with the staff how this has really been, for me, 
uh, as a minister of the Lord, a, a place to come to where it has been life-giving for me. Oftentimes, I go places and they're, um, they're so hungry and so thirsty that you, you really, it really takes a lot out of you. And, and I have been just receiving so much from you. So thank you very much for, for your love. It is um, quite evident. Thank you. Now, to the matters at hand. We're here and we have this wonderful scripture reading and, and Father said, well, if I want to pick my own or shall we take the reading of the day? And this just happens to be the reading of the day. And here we have a Lord who comes to his people in tremendous love and, and he's, he's asking you to come to him and to take upon his yoke. In other words, will we really believe him in that he really does want our very best? And, but to do that means that we need to follow him, to follow his way, and to follow his truth like we've been unpacking over the past couple of days. It's one thing to say that I believe in God, but it, it's another thing to be living in God. And that's the key. And that's the invitation. Are we really willing to come and live in God? Because our faith, the Catholic faith, as I've been trying to unpack, and we really unpacked a little bit last night, so for those of you who were at the, the meeting, first of all, well done. Great job. We talked about the fact that it's, our faith is more than just a, a book of rules where we just have to obey rules. The rules are supposed to lead us to something, or more importantly, someone. Our faith is about a relationship with the living God that we're supposed to have now. So it's not just all one-sided where we come and we just do everything. God promised to provide everything. When you look at every covenant that God has made with humanity, he's always said, I will be your God and I will be your provider. I will give you exactly what you need. The tough part is, is that we live in a culture and in a, in, a, in a country right now where there is a philosophical thought, a school of thought that most people embrace. It's called hedonism. The two major tenets are the pursuit of evil, I mean the pursuit of pleasure, and the avoidance of pain. And somehow we've joined this philosophical thought and said that this is what Christianity is about. And so what we do is we try to make a God of hedonism. Surely if he's God, he's going to prevent us from experiencing pain and suffering, right? I mean, that's what our religion is all about, isn't it? It's all about the blessing. Well, that's not true. We see the cross as the greatest example of love the world has ever known. And isn't it fraught with tremendous suffering and pain? So the truth really is, is that to live authentic love in a fallen world, a world that fell because of sin, to live authentic love in a world that has fallen is to experience some pain. And either we're going to choose to accept that and embrace it, or we're going to continue to run away from the pain. And so long as we run away from the pain, we're running away from the truth. And therefore, we run away from God. The Lord wants you to be healed. But sometimes we want to be healed on our time. Sometimes we want it done according to our agenda. God, I want you to heal me, but I don't want it to cost me anything. That's what I used to do with my brokenness I described last night. Lots of people come to me and they struggle with the same thing. And then, how do I get rid of my problem as quickly as possible? But I found very quickly that what God did with me is he said, okay, I'll help you. We'll get rid of this issue for you. But that's not all I'm going to do. Now I want to teach you how to learn how to die to yourself. And that's hard. Because if we're really going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, if we're really going to, if you remember at Mass, make ourselves a gift back to the Lord, and we're going to be his disciples, then remember what he said. If you're going to be my disciple, you must first deny yourself, then pick up your cross, and then come follow me. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross. And then come follow me. That's hard. It certainly smacks against this whole hedonism thing. And it's challenging. 
Last night I unpacked for you some of the spiritual warfare components. What's the enemy trying to do? And I've, I've just, I've come to believe this is so true, that by the time our little ones have graduated from high school, they are fully formed by the world in this philosophical thought of hedonism. Fully formed. Unfortunately, sometimes we've been, been a part of that formation as we have been pursuing that. We've had our eyes focused. And I'll show you, like, you know, when you go to school, you get to a point where all of a sudden at the end of the grading period, you expect to receive from your children a report card. And on that report card, we're looking for straight because when we graduate from high school, we want them to go to a good so they can graduate from college and get a good because life is all about making lots of welcome to the world's formation 101. <laughs> from my littlest age, from the littlest ages, we've been growing up with the pursuit of one thing money. And now all of a sudden we have this scripture passage in the gospel that says you can't serve two masters. You can't give yourself and devote yourself to God while you're giving yourself and devoting yourself to the attainment of mammon. You can't do both. So which is it? Okay, Lord, I'm going to get myself secure and then I'll give you the leftovers. Does that sound remotely familiar? Been there, done that. I remember the day that the Lord came and kind of confronted me about, you know, I was thinking, well, I'm a youth minister in the church. I don't have to tithe. And then he said, that's silly. And not only is that silly, I don't want you to give me a tithe after you've paid your bills. I want you to make an agreement as to how much you're going to give me back and then make that the first check. And that made me really That was like getting in the wheelbarrow and beginning to trust. And boy, I sure wanted to jump out a bunch of times that time. You see, this formation of the world has been um, sucking us in to showing us a wide variety of different ways of who we should be and what we should be about. And this part of this formation, not only has it been in a pursuit of money, but it's also been in teaching us to become what we weren't created to be. We were created to be men and women of the light, children of the light, children of truth, who were created, we are actually hardwired to live righteousness. We're created for it. How do we know? Because we're created for the beatific vision. What did Jesus say? I am the light of the world, and in me there is no darkness at all. So if that is our destiny, to live in the light of truth, to be whole and perfect and holy and righteous, should we not be working towards that? And that requires us to follow Jesus in earnest. Instead of saying, I believe you, Lord, but let me live my life as if I don't know whether you will. And so what's this formation? We know that when we were younger, Shoot, first grade, you go out to recess, and what happens? You know, when the teacher's there watching all the kids play, that's when some of the most mean words and things are ever said and done, is it not? Even at Catholic schools. Really? And so, as little children, we learn. We learn how to, to defend ourselves, and we start learning all the techniques. In fact, it even starts with a rhyme. Sticks and stones will break my bones, but will never hurt me. What a lie. And from the youngest ages, we begin to start living lies. I know. It happened to me. You see, this formation of the world was trying to tell us different ways of living that, other than living the truth. Like, let me give you this example. See, we're supposed to be a clear vase, but instead, the world has told us, no, 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 you're not acceptable. You're not good enough, so you need to cover up and put on a mask and pretend to be somebody else. Right? I mean, isn't that why we pretend? That was my whole car story yesterday about screaming at my kids, getting in the car, we're going to church. But when I showed up in front of everybody, I had to give you the good, the, the good mask. Because for me, personally, when I was growing up in high school, I had a big problem with height. So I call myself a hobbit deacon. Because I, I looked at all these other guys in high school and they were big and buff and I thought you ladies wanted the big buff guys. And You know, have you ever seen a Hobbit James Bond? No. 
And so that was my issue. And so I learned to put on a mask and pretend to be somebody that I wasn't and try to give you the best presentation of who I thought. Isn't that kind of like what we do when we're dating or courting? Put our best foot forward and all of a sudden once the ring's on, it's over. The mask comes off and they see the real us. And so we have this nice shiny mask. And of course we talked about yesterday the building up of those walls that we put in front of our hearts. Walls that we believe will help us stop the pain. You know, you memorize the phrases. I'm going to show you. Out of sight? Yeah, that's a lie. We think if we can bury it and pretend it no longer existed. By the way, pretending it no longer existed is beginning to live a lie. That doesn't work because our stuff comes back and haunts us, does it not? How about this one? Time heals? Yeah, that's a lie too. God heals all wounds. But yet we buy into it and we are deeply committed to it. So I've got my nice, wonderful mask. And it makes everybody think that I'm great and I'm, I'm this great Catholic and I've got it all together and, and I'm not hurt and I'm fine, I'm healed. But it's okay because you don't know the truth. Because the truth is, is that sometimes we go through life and we trip and fall. Oh, oh no. It's okay because my mask is it's intact. My mask is fine. And that's really what's most important, isn't it? Nobody needs to know the truth. As long as I get you to believe that this is fine, and I can begin to believe that this is just who I really am, no one needs to know that we get hurt and that we live broken lives. But here's the truth. The truth is, is that there's not a single soul in this room that's going to enter the beatific vision until every one of the shards of the brokenness of our lives is completely healed. Well, that's not fair, Deacon Ralph. I mean, I'm a victim. This person hurt me. I didn't do it, I didn't cause it, but I got hurt, I'm an innocent victim. Why can I not enter the life of God until it's totally healed? You're, you're missing the point. God's not sitting up in heaven with a rule book and a, and a ruler measuring you. That's not who our God is. Our God is a God of love, and he wants nothing but your very best. He wants nothing but your very best. But you see, here's the point. No one can heal of anything, physical, spiritual, or emotional bondage and brokenness until they return to the truth. You can't. Let's just say I was helping father around the rectory and he, we, were, we were trimming some trees, and, and I cut my hand really bad, and I've got I've to get ready to go, be, so I've only got an hour, and now my, the, the blood out of my hand is, is getting all over the tools, and I can't work, and I've got a choice. Either I go to the hospital because my hand needs stitches, or else I just ignore it, and I do what the, what the, what the world trained me to do, out of sight, out of mind. So what do I do? I go to the shed. You know, you can do an awful lot with duct tape. And I get me some duct tape, and I wrap it up, and I'm good to go. Now I can grab the tools, and I can finish helping Father, because that's what I want to do. So I'm going to ignore what's really happening, because I desire to do something else. And so all of a sudden, it's time to shower, because we're getting ready for the mission, and I'm thinking, you know, I should take that duct tape off, but it's working so well, let's just keep it on. So I take my shower, and now i got to leave tomorrow morning, and I'm going to go get the rental car, and I'm like, well, I'm showering for the day, I should take it off. Ah, let's leave it on, i got to go pick up my wife. Next thing you know, a week goes by, and my fingers are getting kind of puffy. So I've got a choice. But you see, I'm still too busy. I'm making choices with my life, my powerful gift of free will. I'm still making choices. What am I going to do? And so all of a sudden, it's still not a problem. But finally, after seven days, I wake up next morning, and my hand is is really puffy and it's aching, it's throbbing. Now I'm thinking, okay, as a good hedonist that I was trained to be, the pain in my hand is now unbearable, so I'm willing to sacrifice whatever else I wanted to do to take care of what I need to do. And I go to the hospital, and I got this funny looking red line going up my arm. And if I don't pay attention to it, what's it gonna do? 
if that is the physical reality of our lives, what do you think sin and living lies does to the spiritual reality of our lives? How much do you think our emotional refusal to accept and live the truth affects our physical bodies? It's got to come out somewhere. It's got to, it's got to deal with it. You know, those people who try to bury it down, your body takes a hit every time we don't live the truth. You see, your Heavenly Father wants you to be holy and right and true, not because he's sitting there saying, I'm not going to love you unless... He wants you to be holy, right, and true because you were made for that. Because you won't be happy until you are. Until you're finally brought to fruition. And this whole idea about not letting you go into the beatific vision until you're absolutely, completely healed makes absolutely the most sense. Think of it this way. When I was a youth minister here, I would drive home after retreats. And when my girls were little ankle biter ages, they're all running around. And, but what they couldn't wait to do when I got home is I'd pull up in the van... <laughs> And somebody would scream, Dad's coming! And then immediately everybody would stop what they were doing and they would all run and meet me at the front door and they'd grab my sleeping bag and my bag. They'd take it from me, they'd bring me inside and say, Oh, Dad, come on, sit down. And they'd throw my bags down and they took me to the dining room table. And then they sat down and they said, Okay, tell us, how did Jesus show up this time? Because I would come home and tell them the stories of what happened to these guys on retreat. And the amazing movement of life and God moving through the hearts of our teens. So they couldn't wait to hear. So here's a hypothetical situation. Let's say Hannah, my, my youngest, is eight years old. She's in her room doing some craft work, and all of a sudden she hears, Dad's home! Well, she stops, gets up, runs out. She runs out of her door, goes around the railing, the banister upstairs, goes down three steps to the landing, turns, and now is headed towards the 13 steps downstairs by the front door. And she hits three steps, trips and falls. And open up the front door to find Hannah with a broken femur. Hypothetical. Put your tissues away. <laughs> so at that point, do you think Hannah's ready for me to pick her up and go, oh, honey, I love you. Does she want me to hug her? No. Does she want me to pick her up and go, oh, honey, come here quick. Let me take you to the dinner, to the dining room table and tell you about my retreat. Does she care to listen about my retreat? Does she want me to just sit there and hold her softly on the sofa and just pet her hair because she loves it when I scratch her head like this? Does she want me to love on her like a dad wants to love on his daughter? Does she want her father's love at that point? No. Don't you understand? We have to become completely healed so that we are completely free to receive all of our father's love. It's because you and I were made for love. And so we have decisions. We have a free will to choose. To enter love, to enter truth, to live right or to live wrong. God, before Adam and Eve sinned, he warned Adam and Eve, did he not? Didn't he warn them that something bad was going to happen if they ate of that fruit? So when you hear us preach and we confront you because the world is telling you it's okay like the serpent and we say it's not, it's not because we want to sit here and judge. It's because we understand that when we make an action, there is always going to be a consequence. And no matter how much we pretend that there's no consequences and we live lies and act like it never happened the truth is is that the consequences in you and I are absolutely real whether other people can see it or not God sees your heart he sees how broken you are he sees how wounded you are and he wants to help but until we turn around and we come back to him. Repent, John the Baptist. Until we repent of the lies that we've been doing for our own lives, with our own relationships. Look, this is D-Day for us, guys. We're in Christmas. This is the holidays. We just got through Thanksgiving. We all know what happens at family time. We go and stay at someone's house 
our siblings' house, these are grown adults, staying with their grown adult siblings, for maybe overnight one night. We won't do two, right? Because we know if we go any longer than one night, somebody's going to bump into that elephant in the middle of the room, right? And the minute somebody says a word that breaks open that scab, the women immediately go into action. And they say, I know, please, let's keep the... But you see, that's a lie, because so long as the elephant in the room exists, there is no peace. We come to healing services, but we want God to heal us on our terms, not his. Again, we play God. All he wants is nothing but our very best. Nothing. How do we know? Because he did that to prove it to us. But you know, to believe that he wants our very best requires us to get all the way in the wheelbarrow. All the way in. We have to believe. It requires faith. Listen, one last thing, and then we've got to get on to the real part, and that's the anointing and asking the Lord for healing. When I was a boy, I got wounded really bad. It's a bad, bad situation. Eight and a half years old, I got wounded in an abuse situation in my life. And I made a vow, a promise to myself that I would never tell anybody that story. Never. No one must ever know because I believe that I did that. And as a result of that, I began to live a lie. What happened to me never occurred. 